Hello and welcome back to Talking Africa. This is the weekly edition of Africa Wrap, dedicated to in-depth interviews and analysis. We aim to speak to key decision makers and thought leaders, the people who really know the emerging continent. Well, one such man is undoubtedly Muhammadu Buhari, the man who, subject to debate over security and other issues, will contest next month's Nigerian general election, the challenger to President Goodluck Jonathan. I was invited to meet him in Nigeria to discuss his policies and his chances of taking his all-progressive Congress party to power for the first time since civilian rule was restored in 1999. This is your third or fourth bid for the presidency in Nigeria, and all of them have ended in failure. Why are you running again? Yeah, well, uh, the rest, uh, they failed, as you said, and uh, we ended up uh, in the Supreme Court of Nigeria. So the cases uh, are now public uh, documents. One can go and get them. Uh, we have attempted, and uh, uh, we are going to attempt again for the first time, if my party give me the ticket. Right, but the question is, why are you doing it again? Yes, because I... I have been approached by my supporters. Uh, at uh, some stage, after the third attempt, uh, I think I will not attempt again. But my supporters said they want me to, uh, to attempt again. And uh, I, I, I agreed. Because once I remain in partisan politics, then I have to do what the majority of my supporters want me to do. What do you think the attraction for you is? Um, just to measure the true support uh, I have from the public if the election is credible. Do you believe that the elections will be credible? I am trying to get that. I am trying, we are trying to mobilize our supporters that um, uh, they make sure the election is credible by speaking to INEC, by making sure those uh, our agents uh, are up to the task by getting communication so that they can get a, a from falling unit, they can get to, uh, uh, you know, to other falling units and so on, you know, passing out information as a result comes out to collation areas and so on. What do you think is the big hot button issue in Nigeria today that needs to be urgently addressed? Security. And how would you address that security situation? Well, we hope we will understand the true situation of the security other than the obvious ones. Uh, and then we quickly see how we can uh, remove it. But the question of uh, Security is number one, and the insecurity has to be removed to uh, move forward with Nigeria. And by insecurity, I, I presume you're talking about Boko Haram. Not only Boko Haram. There are abductions throughout Nigeria. Uh, company executives have been uh, uh, abducted, and impossible amounts being demanded. Uh, senior citizens across the country are being abducted. You know, for political, mostly for, for money, uh, extortion of, of money. So people are feeling very, very insecure. Now, obviously, one of the big issues in Nigeria today is the question of Boko Haram and the insurgency in the north. As you mentioned there, it's, it's a hot button issue. How would you deal with that insurgency? I, I think the first thing is intelligence. We must have. Uh, uh, the government's uh, ability to collect intelligence, credible intelligence, and prepare uh, operations accordingly is very, very important. You, you go into the field without knowing who is the enemy, uh, I think is a terrible mistake. Do you think this current government is unwilling or unable to do that? Do you think the army has been so depleted in terms of its resources that it just doesn't have the capacity to gather the intelligence and it wouldn't make any difference whether it's this government or you in power. I think the government's failure 
to motivate the military to effectively um, deal with the insurgents uh, is extremely disappointing. Because Nigeria is so resourceful, both human and material, that Nigeria can really secure itself. But this failure, I am afraid, cannot be explained. It cannot be explained other than incompetence of the government. It's sheer incompetence of the government. Now, the Nigerian military and the government say they're doing their best to protect the citizens in the Northeast. Do you think their best is good enough? Certainly, their best is not good enough because the insecurity is, is, uh, is getting overwhelming. But, I mean, do you, do you not agree, though, that in matters like this insurgency, it takes a lot of time and lots of effort to achieve a durable peace? Peace. Well, it's unfortunate Nigerian Boko Haram has been allowed to develop into the type of uh, uh, insurgency in other countries we mentioned now. Um, be because um, uh, those who are following the development of Boko Haram you know, started from the incompetence uh, of, of policing in that area. And that's what has stated it, the policing of the area. And policing means real intelligence. Earlier this month, the Emir of Kano called on people to defend themselves against Boko Haram. He urged citizens to acquire what they need to protect themselves. Do you support that call, or do you think um, that, like some skeptics, that it is a call to anarchy? No, I, I support the Emir because um, if you are uh, those who are closely following in the operations of Boko Haram. If Borno State government did not develop the JTF, the civilian, That's the joint task force. Just joint task force, you know, uh, the capital could have been overrun by now because the pattern of Boko Haram operation is to secure a base in the northeast. Preferably, uh, Borno, uh, a state capital with airport, with the communication and so on, and then fan uh, outwards. But uh, when the, uh, the leadership, the civilian leadership in, in Borno State uh, encouraged the youth uh, to, to look after their environment and so on, uh, they relegate the, uh, the Boko Haram to the peripheral, you know, and to the, the neighboring states. So really, what the Emir of Kano said uh, was what uh, was tried in Borno State and has worked. Trust Bank will be there now and into the future because you're at the heart of everything we do. Guarantee Trust Bank, proudly African, truly international.
What do you think motivates Boko Haram? Is it religious fanaticism or a protest and government neglect? No, it's, it's, uh, it's the politicians uh, that uh, uh, look for uh, unemployed youth, uh, give them weapons and the drugs, and send them after their political enemies. And then subsequently they got out of hand. This is how the Boko Haram developed. Now you were quoted as saying that an attack on Boko Haram was an attack on the entire northern region of Nigeria. For many of your critics, that was the clearest indication that you were sympathetic to the insurgents. And, and as a matter of fact, that same brush has apparently also tarred the leadership of your party, the APC, because people perceive them to be in cahoots with the insurgents. Do you regret making that statement, or do you still stand by it? Yes, well, uh, I didn't make such a statement. Uh, what has, was the statement I made that was misinterpreted was when the military operated in Baga and Bama in the northeast. And I, um, and I told them that if uh, soldiers, uh, if the civilians in a certain area uh, killed a policeman or a soldier, the military or the police should display restraint they will try and find out the leadership of the individuals, not to go and raise down a whole part of a town, killing everything that moves and burning the houses. That was what I said, and I still stand by that. The military must show restraint. Try and get, look at what happened at the initial scene of Boko Haram. Well, the police couldn't handle it, according to our internal uh, security internal operation of Nigeria, they handed it over to the army. The army in charge then, you know, they went and got Yusuf, who was the leader of Boko Haram, and they handed him over to the police according to law. But he died in police custody. He was killed in police custody. His uh, uh, in-law was killed. Their houses were raised down. While everybody knew the rights him, was to interrogate him, prosecute him, and punish him. That would have doused, you know, uh, the, the tension, and the insurgency wouldn't have been blown up. But to be, uh, 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 to kill leadership, even if it were of, uh, of insurgents, you know, make the insurgents uh, uh, more encouraged, you know, to commit even more atrocities. Yeah, but you don't, you yourself don't exactly have a reputation for being someone who operates within democratic mores. I mean, your experience of governance in Nigeria was from the position of a military dictatorship. You led a military dictatorship in 1983, and you actually went into prison, pulled people out who had already been tried in court and sentenced to prison terms for carrying drugs and ordered them to be shot. Well, uh, that uh, allegation could be true, but I didn't go to prison. But to, I accept leadership to be accused of final decision of government. But the government decided then that all those who trafficked in drug should be executed. Yeah, but it was a dictatorship. You led the dictatorship. Yes, I did. So it came from you. I did. Well, it's not individualistic. Even in the dictatorship, we have a system. We have a supplementary council. We have a council of state that comprises the governors. There are also people who say that you've never actually been in a democratic setting, that you've come from the tradition of military dictatorships. I mean, how would you, for instance, deal with a, a national assembly that asks questions about what you, you, what you plan to do? They have a choice. The constitution of Nigeria in 1990 is amended, that was the guideline. So Nigerians have a choice. And what we are asking now is for a free, fair, and credible election. So let Nigerians be given the opportunity to choose their leaders.
there have been a number of incidents involving the opposition and what appear to be elements from the security services, um, including the attempt to stop the Speaker of the House, who's a member of your party, from entering the National Assembly, and a recent raid on the APC's offices in Lagos. Do you think these are overt attempts to muzzle the opposition as we approach the elections? And do you attribute those um, raids on the, the ruling People's Democratic Party, or to the ruling People's Democratic Party? Well, once the security agencies act outside the constitutional, their constitutional law, then they must have been ordered by the executive. But certainly, it's unconstitutional for the National Assembly to be physically attacked, as we all saw. So those who are supposed to protect and guard the Constitution are violating it now. So we're already in a state of anarchy. How much does that concern you going into the elections? Well, um, this has to be drummed into Nigerian heads that this government is already acting unconstitutional. And the safest thing for them is to vote it out. Do you expect that this election is going to be free and fair? Yes, I do. That's why I'm spending so much time on it. If it is not free and fair, then uh, we shall see. What happens if it's not, if, you, if your people, because what I'm trying to look at is what appears to be a custom. I mean, every single time that you've run and you have lost, you've accused the other party of rigging the elections and of the, the, you know, the, the elections not being free and fair. And in fact, the last time, if I recall, there was almost an uprising in the north of Nigeria as a result of the fact that you said the elections, that you'd been rigged out. That clearly was a major security threat to this country, given the fragility of the situation right now. What would you say to your supporters about uh, abiding the same rule of law that you talk about, sticking to the rule of law and not um, going out in riots and so on, and to follow the constitutional means of going to a court of law to determine whether you lost or not? If I don't believe in uh, the rule of law, would I? for three successive times, last in several years, go to court and ending up in the Supreme Court in each case, having do the field work, collect our data, and confront the, the cause with it. Don't forget, in 2007, the Supreme Court was split into two, the justices. There were seven justices. Three justices, justices said that uh, the election were not conducted according to law. So they have annulled it. Three other just said, yes, there were flaws, you know, in the election, but that wouldn't have stopped the ruling party from winning. And then the chief justice cast his vote with them. So I believe in the rule of law. This is why I ended up in court up to Supreme Court. In each case, I was alleged to have lost. And the records are there. Do you also believe that there is a religious element in politics in Nigeria and that because you're a Muslim and from the north that every time that you run and you fail to win it is seen as an attack on Muslim people in this country? No, I, I think um, I think Nigeria has believed that um, according to the constitution Nigerians can practice any religion they want. That is guaranteed by the Nigerian constitution and anybody who does not believe in that, then he will either walk out of Nigeria or go to Nigeria Supreme Court to see if he can effect change. But as is a very big but, the government in power must be seen to be respecting and protecting the constitution instead of subverting it. I'm not entirely sure I understand what you mean. What happened in the National Assembly? Is there no subversion of the constitution? How can you go into the National Assembly and uh, fire tear gas? That institution is sacred. Yeah, but that didn't happen the last time you ran for office. I mean, what I'm trying to say, this is a recent development. Yeah, but what we are, we are talking of the next election, if the government 
will uh, so uh, <laughs> uh, subvert the country itself, then how are we sure the government will respect the processes of credible election? What would happen if you lose the elections? Do, do you think the North would rise up against the, country, the rest of the country? I'm not uh, contesting as a Muslim northerner. I'm contesting as a Nigerian member of, uh, of, uh, of a Nigerian party, the All Progressive Con Congress. So to try to uh, uh, give it a northern or Islamic touch, I think it's very unfair to the system itself. There's been what appears to be a vigorous attempt by the Central Bank of Nigeria and Finance Ministry officials to reassure the public over the dramatic fall in oil prices and its potential knock-on effect on the Nigerian economy. Many Nigerians believe that some sort of economic crisis is looming on the back of the oil price slump and the subsequent fall in the value of the Naira. Now, if you were president, how would you react to that crisis and what appears to be austere times ahead? Uh, I think we have to cut down wastages. Um, that has to be said, uh, we, the government has to sit down and articulate a policy that will not hurt its own economic uh, uh, activities. Uh, the most important thing, let us get um, uh, the structure once more, uh, led by power, uh, and let's encourage manufacturing so that employment and goods and services you know, will be available. Um, but these are obviously long-term things. I mean, you can't wave a magic wand at manufacturing. No, no, you, right. you can. What no. would you do in the short term? In, in, in the short term is to uh, certainly see where you can effect savings, uh, wastages in government, um, um, especially in, in terms of uh, fleet of vehicles, uh, use of petroleum uh, products and so on, and use more of communication, which is highly advanced now, uh, and, le and less movement. And then try and see how much you can quickly do through two sources that I believe will uh, uh, cut down unemployment. That's agriculture and solid minerals. Put the unemployed, able-bodied youth into the field. That can be done very quickly. The land is available. 
there's infrastructure, there are a number of dams, uh, and the irrigation system is waiting to be developed and putting people uh, into the fields throughout there instead of, uh, of seasonal farming and so on. But are you suggesting that, that agriculture isn't being dealt with? Because, I mean, this government has been commended, not just in Nigeria, but internationally for what it's done with agriculture and, and the fact that it's received awards, in fact, um, you know, huge commendation. I mean, are you saying that that is too little, not enough, or yes. they're not doing anything at all? No, we can't say they're not doing anything at all, but much more can be done. Much more can be done in agriculture and certain minerals. The other major issue in Nigeria is, of course, corruption. How would you deal with corruption? It's getting worse because uh, people that are corrupt, they are considered that they have made it, whether they invest in or outside the country, and how they flout their riches uh, in the middle of uh, pauperized people. But is that something that's happening with this current government, or is that something that has come from the past? It's not good enough. Much more can be done to stop corruption much more can be done. So what would you do? What we will do, we will tell the public, especially the institutions that handle national resources, that our tolerance for corruption is zero, absolutely zero. Let's talk a little bit about your person, your personality and the perceptions of the sort of person that you are. I mean, people say that you're out of touch with a modern age. I mean, you're over 70 years old, there's some particularly young people think that you're too old and that you don't understand the age of computers. Christians say that you're a hardline fundamentalist. What would you, your response be to those perceptions of you? If my party gives me the ticket, then people, based on their own assessment and understanding of me as a candidate, they should vote or reject me. That is the beauty of this system. Yeah, but what I'm saying is that what would you, your response, I mean, you can't just say that. People want to hear from you to know whether or not they should decide to vote for you or not, assuming you win the ticket of the APC. I mean, what would your response be to people who, for instance, say that you're out of touch with the modern world, that you're, you're too old, and, and therefore you're, you're not really familiar with the way that the you know, computer age has actually evolved in the 21st century? Well, what have they done with their computer age? The president head of state, uh, president, how old is he? Well, is it his 50s? Uh -huh. You're in your 70s. Yes. Then how, how is the government doing? How has this government been doing? It's not a question of uh, ICT qualification that makes a good leadership. I have experienced all these developments. We try and find out uh, how was this country earned, uh, under the leadership of, of, of the ruling party and the state of the infrastructure. There is no way our industries can break even when there is no power. There is no way our industries can employ people and produce goods if parts of the country are in the hands of uh, terrorists. So this country has woefully, this government has woefully failed. The ruling party, PDP, has, has woefully failed this country. There's been talk of infighting within the APC, your party, and people say that this could possibly lead to an even bigger problem for the rest of Nigeria, uh, because if you're all fighting each other, I mean, your, your party could quite easily implode. What's your reaction to that? I, th I think they have to give the system a chance. The system provides that if you don't provide it consensus, if you don't provide it a consensus, you can um, have uh, primaries which we are conducting throughout the country so that people can go and elect those that will stand uh, to be elected at various levels, whether House of Assembly, Representative, Senate, Governorship of the Presidency. So the system has taken that into account. So it's up to the people 
that feel strongly about the system to organize themselves and present their case through their delegates, through their candidates. I think the system is very good. Finally, General Buhari, what is your message to the Nigerian people? I have nothing new to tell the Nigerian people other than the things they know and their experience. The insecurity, you know, the lack of jobs, and the corruption in this country. And people can reflect and find out that there are credible feature article reasons that say, unless Nigerians kill corruption, corruption will kill Nigeria. General Buhari, on behalf of Arise Television News, I want to thank you exceedingly for giving us this exclusive interview. Thank you very much indeed. Welcome back to Talking Africa with me, Heather Scott, picking up the conversation. Now, this program is the latest in a brand new series here on Arise News, a special weekly edition of Africa Wrap, where we take time to reflect on the fortunes and affairs of the emerging continent within its own countries and across the world in an hour of conversation with African commentators and thought leaders. Well, I'm joined now by Temitope Olodo, a terrorism expert and security strategist with deep experience across Africa. Also with me is Joseph Dankwa, the Ghanaian political activist and commentator. Well, thank you very much indeed, gentlemen, thank for you. coming. Well, let's uh, look back at some of the major themes and uh, big stories of, uh, that have been coming out of Africa this last week. And we start with North Africa and the human tragedy of more than 300 lives lost in the Mediterranean Sea. Migrants who set sail from a beach near Libya's capital, Tripoli, in four separate boats, hoping to realize a dream of making it to Europe. But instead, they lost their lives when their boats capsized in the heavy seas of a winter storm. Well, 
This is becoming more and more regular, yeah. uh, this, these occurrences. Yeah. I mean, people in these leaky boats, uh, trafficked by people. Now, data from the EU border agency, Frontex, confirms a big increase in migrants making this, these hazardous yeah. boat journeys. How big do you think the problem is? Let's start with you, Joseph. It's, it's getting worse. There's been a steady increase of people trying to come from North Africa and in Syria and Libya and all other places down to Europe. It was 60,000 in 2013. Now, that, uh, last year, it was 175,000, which shows there's been a threefold increase of people trying to come down. And many people, as much as 3,500 people, lost their lives last year. So therefore, if it continues, if the trend continues this way, it's going to be a human tragedy. You've got to be pretty desperate to put your lives and presumably all your money yeah. in the hands of these people traffickers, yeah. probably knowing that you won't make it necessarily. Yes, the, the, the news is out there that many people are not making it, but people want to um, go to greener, uh, greener pasture. People are concerned for their family and they want better life for their family. And, and this is the responsibility for the AU to actually look at it and create a roadmap on how to deal with this issue. The victims are the people that are paying the money, are being trafficked. And you know, we need to go after the people behind the traffickers, are the people we need to go after and address this thing from the root itself. Now, you're a security expert. Yeah. It's all about security and all it about is. the breakdown of uh, civil society. Yeah, it is. It is. And, and some of the individuals that are running away might pose a security risk to Europe. And that's the reason why you know, there is this you know, um, antique and you know, beating of drums on this matter to try and resolve it. And, you know, you know, when Gaddafi was there, you know, he was he had some relationship with Europe, Europe to try and stem it. Now that there is nobody, you know, everybody is fighting each other. It's free flow for you know, the traffickers to to you know to just dump people you know onto the sea and you know let them you know find out their life and you know, find a way out for their life. And this is not good for security generally. Indeed. I mean, yeah. uh, Libya is a basket case at the moment. Um, yeah. But it's not only Libya, is it? I mean, what's happening in Syria, Syria. all these refugees going yeah. to Turkey, yeah. those sort of routes yeah. across as well. Yeah. We've got some, some um, refugees from Syria, Iraq, and other parts of the Middle East and in Africa going down, getting to Lampedusa, and that is their point where they congregate and try to get into Europe. And the thing is that if it continues that way, the pressure is, is, is coming to bear on the Italian government. Yeah. How do they cope with it financially? Apart from that, there is, it, it will create social economic problems. The people in Italy would therefore say, these are an influx of immigrants. How are we going to cope with it economically, socially, even politically? And these are things which the AU and the EU have to come together to find a common solution. Yeah. Indeed, it was, it was up to uh, Italy in the end with their Mare Nostrum project, yeah, which yes. they abandoned because they didn't feel they were getting the support, did they? Yeah, and, and, I, and I think this is, this is part of the issue here. And politics is having a role here. Italy is going through a lot in terms of its economic status, you know, and we all know that, and the fact is, you know, these are human beings that are losing their lives. Uh, you know, Italy has an obligation within international law to ensure that the safety of people and patrolling of those, of those waters to ensure that people are brought out of it alive. But if you bring them out alive, then they claim asylum. And yeah. this is where the politics comes in. Indeed. Yeah. And yeah. Uh, you, you've got, I mean, we hear all this talk about austerity in Europe. Yes. It's very interesting that uh, none of these migrants necessarily end up in Greece because mm. it's just not worth it to go no. to Greece. No, so they'll come, they, where they end up is either in Italy, Spain, um, Germany, Britain, you know, they find places where they can. The economy is, is thriving. And therefore, the impression they have is that Europe is doing well, better than what is in Africa or in the Middle East. So therefore, they want to see greener pastures. But it's coming at a cost. Yeah. It's a cost will eventually become unbearable. Yeah. And this is what needs to be, to be, to be tackled. But let's come to the, the point of it. If African leaders were able to to, 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 look, to help their nations move forward economically and politically, there will be no need for it. Indeed. Apart from, the, apart from the, the problem with security, which we know they are war, but the general problem is 
bad leadership has caused most of these problems. What do you think the African Union should do practically to help? I, I think there, there is need for a proper action plan in terms of how things will move on from now onwards. You know, one life lost is more than enough, yeah. not to talk of 75,000. And we're into, you know, the first quarter of, of the year of 2015. And we know that if we continue at this rate, many people will, will lose their life. And there is, you know, war in, you know, South Sudan and, you know, Libya mm -hmm. issue, the Nigerian issue. You know, we, we need to ensure security. We need, they need to be more proactive and stop the firefighting approach. On yeah, issues. indeed. What what always strikes me about mm. this, we've got all these sides of the problem. Yeah. We've got the poor people who are, feel compelled to take to the seas in these leaky boats. Yeah. You've got the countries where they end up if they're lucky. Yeah, exactly. yeah. But nobody seems to be going after the traffickers themselves. Yeah. Why do you think they don't go for them? You see, the traffickers are mostly they move. They are, they are mostly like gangs. And they have these. They have their network in which they 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 they, 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 have, they have their maybe they have the agents in in maybe the countries they are moving from, and they have the the main man who is maybe in the the country where they want to end up, and many of them are well organized networks. They deal, they deal, and they most of them are they deal with, with intimidation. They work with intimidation. Apart from you paying the money, most of these victims are have their families. Warned that if you were able to come out and say something, you will be attacked. Your fam you are indebted them for life. We heard stories that people get into Italy where the ladies end up in prostitution. The men are asked to work on farms, carrying so many, you know, um, bags and you know, um, what do you call it, tons of you know tomatoes. Which end of the day, they have to pay back the money they've given. And see, it's it, it's a cycle of you know suffering and poverty and I want to come out of poverty therefore I have to I have to sacrifice everything I have and it's not easy for them you see so that's why these gang members or these these overlords are getting away from because these people feel they're indebted to the to the to the to the overlords and therefore you you have to obey them and therefore if you make the false move that's it you're in trouble like a gentleman for the okay. moment mm -hmm. uh, we'll take a very short break there mm -hmm. but when we come back uh, we'll be talking about the new wave of foreign troops heading into Nigeria to help in the fight against the Islamist insurgents, Boko Haram. Welcome back to Talking Africa here on Arise News as we continue conversation with my guest this week, Temitope Olodo, a terrorism expert and security strategist with deep experience across Africa. Also with me is Joseph Dankwa, the Ghanaian political activist and commentator. Well, now, after all the months of talking, this is the week that the military muscle of regional neighbours has really begun to be brought together in the battle against the Islamist insurgency of Boko Haram. Niger's parliament voted to send troops to Nigeria to join the fight. That vote took place after Boko Haram attacked a prison and detonated a car in the town of Diffa, near Niger's border with Nigeria. Well, MPs said Parliament unanimously authorised deploying 750 soldiers with a regional force battling Boko Haram. Well, part of what's now known to be a military alliance between Nigeria, Cameroon, Chad, Niger and Benin that will add up to a 7,800 strong force to fight the group. Well, Temi, you're, you're well versed on radicalization and yes. Nigeria's security efforts. In 2002, uh, you started working with the British government, working in many sensitive strategic roles internationally. So, is this it? Is this enough soldiers? Is this enough commitment? It's a starting point. 
um, when you're looking at uh, this kind of insurgency, these guys are rooted. When they started initially, they started in a village, they moved into a town and attacked the UN headquarters, you know, in Nigeria. And since then, many commentators, including myself, have said that the neighboring countries need to straighten their borders and they need to have a proper urban security strategy, you know, and containment approach to address the issue of Boko Haram. It has grown. It now owns territories, control territories, and now owns its own government. It's not a, a group that you could just get rid of like that in one day, except you're willing to overlook all the human rights issues or concerns that need to be put in place. So there need to be a proper control and command strategy, a proper containment strategy, and there need to be a way to take away some of the people, you know, that are being radicalized on a daily basis that are joining this people. Because it's like a tap of water. This tap is running. Now, if you don't stop this tap, you could kill one, there'll be another three joining them. And that's the challenge that we've always had, that you're killing them, and there have been a lot that have been killed since 2002, when this whole issue started, up to now, and yet they're still growing in numbers. And that is the area that I need, I, I believe that these countries need to look at. It's about how to stop the oxygen, how to stop this radicalization that is going on. If you're able to stop it, empower the youth, move them away from that, you know, de-radicalize them, disengage some of them, then you'll be able to stop Boko Haram and its track. Joseph, I mean, you know, <laughs> as Temi was saying, it's been going on since 2002. Yeah. Um, it's now supposed to be fixed in six weeks. Um, this is never going to happen. Uh, well, I mean, this is something I find it very hard to phantom and believe that they can be fixed within six weeks. As Temi said, it's been happening since 2002. And I believe that the Nigerian government has been very complacent on this issue, thinking that it was a northern issue, so therefore the northerners should tackle it, and therefore people were seeing it as, oh, it's not part of my problem. But now it's got, it has grown wings and has become a sub-regional issue. Yeah. And when it becomes a sub-regional issue, therefore other, it might even become a na national issue, because therefore Cameroon is accusing Nigeria of allowing its troops to cross into Cameroon, and therefore could even can become a larger and bigger war. The Nigerian government then under President Obasanjo didn't take it seriously. If it had quelled that clamor for um, Sharia law at that time, I don't think the Boko Haram would have arisen. They should have cut it off there and then. But then when they were taking like a physical approach and trying to sweep it under the carpet and not trying to pay so much attention to it, therefore the Boko Haram arose from such clamour for, 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 for uh, the issue of Sharia law. Yeah. Indeed. We've got the sort of a hard core of the uh, original Boko Haram, but actually the, the foot soldiers, as it were, are really just young boys yeah. who are looking for a meal and they're looking for something to do. They've got no jobs. Uh, exactly. And Part of the challenges that we've always had in Nigeria is that they might have beautiful policies mm. to address issues, but there's always a problem with implementation. Mm. So uh, now they've talked about having a counter-terrorism strategy since last year. Nobody has seen, you know, in terms of the monitoring of it, evaluation of those policies to check it out to see have it delivered? Is it fit for purpose? Does it need to be uh, amended? Does it need to be localized? Does it need to be shifted? You know. We look at different examples around the world and see how it's done and how Nigeria could tap into those different experiences. Nobody has seen anything about Nigeria's strategy. And I'm not saying this, I'm not saying this in a negative way. I'm not saying mm. that Nigerian government is not working there. You, know, you, and all those you hear no mention no, no, of the no, Chibok no. girls, no. nothing in, in no. the campaign. And, and I remember that I was told off at one point when mm. I actually said, you know what? When the Chibok girls were picked up, you know, how much does it cost to have a Skype with all the families in one hotel in Maduguri, put there, supported by, you know, with uh, medical support and things, and for the president to beam into it, or for the president to fly over, over took Chibok area? It a very area. long time to go and see them, didn't yeah. he? And, and that is where the challenge is, because we're a bit slow in our response. When you hear about, when you hear a police siren in Nigeria, it's either because there is 
a dignitary going yeah, through, the president. you know, <laughs> or you know, they are, or they have their own uh, personal agenda. Mm -hmm. It is not in response to an emergency, mm -hmm. never, Indeed. and that's where the challenge is. So mm -hmm. a big wake-up call yeah. uh, for the moment, gentlemen. Uh, time for another very short break there, but when we come back, we'll be taking a look at some of the many positive stories coming out of Africa this week. Stories selected by my guests. Thinking of banking in Africa? Then think Zenith, one of the biggest in Nigeria, with assets over $16 billion. Listed among the 20 most influential brands in the world and winner of Best Bank in Corporate Governance. The most customer-focused bank in Nigeria. A success built on three foundations dedicated to people, technology, service. Zenith Bank, in your best interest. Welcome back to Talking Africa here on Arise News. Now, each week we ask our guests to highlight some of the positive stories that have come out of Africa, which have caught their eye in the last seven days. Well, we start with you, Joseph, yeah. and the aeroplane builder of South Sudan. Tell yeah. us his story. Yeah, yeah, Joseph George Mill. He lives in South Sudan in Juba, and he's, he's a very ambitious young man. He, he actually had to drop out of school in 2011 when his father passed away, but... He's always had the ambition to build a plane. So, um, like from you do. the story, <laughs> yes, but he, he, what he did was that he was getting scrap from the backyards of Juba and he was putting it together. And when he, he, he realized that he was getting somewhere, so he was able to get some engines and he, he's got a light plane. But he's, and he took this plane over to um, the, the South Sudanese Air Force and they gave him a job in the department, in the IT department. But then he says, <laughs> If he's, he's not been allowed to, to, to test it, but he's got the model there. And he said eventually he would like to use that as a, for, in, for, for agriculture in terms of like spraying of crop crops, testing. Yeah, crop testing, that sort of thing. This was all done in the midst of a civil war. Yes, and, this, and what he's, what he's he sprayed the colours of South Sudan and says, I read on it, there is hope. Oh. And this is, what, this is a, 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 a touching story in the midst of, of war. 11 million people at war, but there's one man who has, who's, who, who's given the country a lot of hope. And this is a positive story of South Sudan. That's a brilliant story. Yes. Well, uh, Temi, you've wanted to talk about the Central African Republic government minister who was kidnapped by gunmen yeah. last month and he's now been freed. Yes, um, and, and I think that that is a positive story because, you know, we've, had, we've seen what is happening in that country. We've seen a very peaceful country all torn upside down and likely to even break you know along religious lines and you know, having one of the ministers kidnapped if he was killed or something have happened to him that could have just sparked another another tension and the fact that he's been returned and Tibalaka were actually you know um, pointed out as being responsible and they said no we're not responsible for it and I, and I thought this is a positive news the fact that he's been found you know and he's back you know or, or, or he'll be back that, that is good news now there were a couple of other kidnaps at the same time yeah. uh, one of a UN worker and an aid worker yeah. also released do we know whether or not a ransom was paid Th that is difficult because there's no information actually being released on that uh, I, I think what we are hoping is that with these groups being brought together and, uh, and you know, 
discussions now ongoing about trying to resolve the whole matter. We're hoping that you know, peace will again reign you know, in the Central African country. That's what we're hoping for. Now, the CAR's government said it made it possible. How so, do you mm. think? Interesting. Well, they might have their ears to the ground or be speaking to key you know, individuals within you know, those groups you know, to try and you know, make sure. Because, you see, in any country, in any, any particular area, people that work within the security establishments are aware of people that could be responsible for certain acts. So if you're stealing, they know who to go to for stealing. <laughs> so if you kidnap, they know who to go to for kidnap. So they might have called on one or two favors or spoken to one or two people and explain or highlight the, the sensitivity of such individual being injured or you know, all killed. But a story with a happy ending. With a happy ending. Indeed. Joseph, now, alternative energy. You want to talk yes. about, uh, you want to take us to Rwanda now to talk Rwanda, about yeah. uh, solar farms. How, what kind of a significant impact are they making? Well, it's, it's that solar farm they've done. There's a solar farm which has been made in the Agahoso Shalom area. Which is, which is an area where there's an orphanage for those, for the kids of those who were killed during the, the what they call genocide. And it's a 8.5 um, million megawatt um, solar field. And it's, it's, it's contributing around 7% to the, to the energy of the country. Which is a huge amount. A huge amount, which is significant. And it's the first in, the, in, South, in Southern Africa. And this could be a blueprint for the African continent. It is, because one thing you can guarantee mm. having in, in Africa huh. is sun. Yes, yes. <laughs> we're not short of it sun. It comes up every day every and it day. goes down in the you evening. Do, you don't need to listen to the weather forecast. No. So the, the thing here is that this is, made, this is going on in a country which 20 years ago was devastated by a genocide of a killing of over 500,000 people. If a country like this could come out of this crisis, there is hope for the continent. Yep. We have to look at the positives of saying that Africans can at least do something which is homegrown. Indeed, because uh, uh, we we're hearing how Russia is coming into Africa yes. and offering nuclear energy yes. to Egypt and, yes. and to South Africa. Yeah. This is a much cleaner and safer form of energy. Yes, it's cleaner and safer, and it's something which it's, it's cost them 23.7 million dollars to do this, but the benefits are, are, are oh, far out weigh anything else. Yeah. I mean, it's cleaner, it's safer, it's it's guaranteed. You know, you you are you're not at, you're not at the mercy of you know global warming and that sort of thing. It's it is it is the best thing which could ever done, to, which could have happened to the continent and to Rwanda in particular. So I believe that African countries should look upon this and say we should take this out and this thing in particular, in, for instance, in Sub-Saharan Africa, we have a major crisis with energy. Most of the Sub-Saharan African countries, where, where we, we rely on hydroelectric, where the, the rivers were giving them energy. But now it's it's all drying up with the bad weather patterns. No, but you get the sun yeah. every day. Yes. Every day. We can, you, can't, you can't run away from that fact. So this <laughs> is very important. This is where the future lies. Yes. Yes. Well, finally, to you again, Tenny. And uh, Mozambique uh, opposition have ended the boycott against yes. the newly elected uh, government government yeah. after talks with the president how so because renamo is not was going to was going to boycott uh, uh, they said the elections were fraudulent yes. they were going to form a parallel government yeah. what changed and, and i was very happy when i when i saw this because <clears throat> at least now you know a peace you know current because th there was the possibility that there was going to be serious political violence, mm. especially when there is a language now that goes across Africa now from opposition party who will set up parallel government across North South West. <laughs> every one of them is talking about setting up, and and that that is a serious issue. And when I saw these days that you know there was a reaching out from the you know from the uh, winning leader and you know talking to and and this discussion and now he's come on board, and I think that is what. Other African leaders and other opposition leaders should see because we are in it together. You know, the, the making and breaking of Africa or any other country is for all of us. The dividends of democracy is for the people. It's not for their own selfish interests. And, and I think this is good news that he's come on board to try and... And, know, and he's changed the habit of a lifetime. I mean, yes. Alfonso Lacama disputed the outcome of every election since 1990. <laughs> yeah. So he's done really well. He's done really well. <laughs> we're hoping it will help the people. Yes. Uh, because this is it, it's all about the people. And I think this yeah. is what African leaders need to learn.
Okay, yeah. thanks very much indeed. Well, my thanks to Temi Tope Olodo and Joseph Dankwa, and also our thanks go to Nigeria's challenger for the presidency, Mohamedou Buhari, for his time and insights earlier in the program. And that's all from Talking Africa this week. We're back every night with Africa Wrap at 1800 GMT here on Arise News. From me, Heather Scott in London, and from Charles Anyogolo in Abuja. Goodbye, and thank you for watching.